James Hamernick. Subcommittee, <clears throat> Subcommittee will please come to order. At the beginning, the chair wishes to extend his uh, uh, most earnest hope that uh, Congressman Kyle's father, who underwent uh, cardiac surgery a few days ago, uh, and who is on the road to recovery, will soon do so. We Thank appreciate you. your being so being here. <clears throat> this morning, the subcommittee resumes its hearings on widespread abuses favoritism and mismanagement in hot programs throughout the country. Since our last hearing, there have been significant reforms and changes at HUD, both legislative and administrative. In November, Congress passed the HUD Reform Act of 1989, which will make HUD programs less susceptible to waste, fraud, abuse, and political influence. In his statement approving the HUD Reform Act, President Bush specifically acknowledged the contribution of this uh, oversight subcommittee, and I'm quoting, for adding to the understanding of the past problems at HUD and contributing to the, to the development of an effective legislative package, end quote. Congress also passed the Clean Consultants Act of 1989, a measure that Senator Byrd of West Virginia introduced in the Senate and that Congressman Christopher Shays and I introduced in the House. This act prohibits the use of federal funds to pay people to influence decision-making in agencies such as HUD and forces the public disclosure of consultants' names who are paid with non-federal funds. The hope and intent of this new law is to put so-called consultants like James Watt, who received several hundred thousand dollars for making a few phone calls, out of business. Perhaps Mr. Watt can instead do television commercials. For example, hi, I'm former Interior Secretary James Watt. When you make $30,000 per telephone call, you want to be sure that your call goes through the first time. That is why I use AT&T. Much of the subcommittee's work in unearthing and exposing the problems at HUD during the Pierce administration has been completed. As a result, and with the valuable cooperation of HUD Secretary Jack Kemp, reforms have been enacted. We are in the process of preparing a comprehensive report with specific findings and additional legislative and administrative recommendations. There are still, however, many unanswered questions. Last Thursday, a most significant event took place. The Attorney General asked the court to appoint an independent counsel occasionally referred to as a special prosecutor, to investigate allegations of criminal wrongdoing by former HUD Secretary Pierce and others relating to the administration of the moderate rehabilitation housing program. I agree with the Attorney General's decision to seek the appointment of an independent counsel to investigate and resolve questions of possible criminal wrongdoing. However, I strongly disagree with the narrow and limited scope of the independent counsel's jurisdiction as proposed by the Attorney General. This does not necessarily mean that Secretary Pierce committed perjury before our subcommittee or that he engaged in criminal conduct with respect to other hot programs. But it is clear that there are reasonable grounds to believe that other areas also warrant full investigation. And those reasonable grounds should have made the proposed jurisdiction of the Independent Council much broader. As has happened in the past, 
most notably in the Watergate investigation headed by the late Senator Sam Irvin of North Carolina and the Iran-Contra investigation by Chairman Lee Hamilton and Daniel Inouye, there is occasionally a compelling need for simultaneous parallel investigations by Congress and by law enforcement agencies. Matters that may be of concern for legislative purposes may not be of importance for law enforcement purposes. And matters which may be critical for law enforcement purposes may have only limited legislative relevance. The subcommittee, therefore, is duty-bound to proceed with its investigation of abuses at HUD. This is particularly true since in recent weeks the subcommittee staff has uncovered a great deal of relevant new information. Yet, in light of the Attorney General's action last Thursday, it is only appropriate that before we conduct further hearings specifically involving matters which the Attorney General has determined warrant the appointment of an independent counsel, the subcommittee cooperatively consult with the independent counsel. Our first witness this morning was to have been Mr. Thomas Demery, former HUD Assistant Secretary of Housing. However, since our questioning of Mr. Demery would relate principally to matters which the Attorney General has determined warrant appointment of an independent counsel, Mr. Demery's appearance before the subcommittee has been postponed until after our meeting with independent counsel. It should be noted that Mr. Demery has been cooperative with the subcommittee and stood ready to be here today to testify voluntarily. I might add that even if there is the slightest possibility that questioning Mr. Demery today would in any way have interfered with uh, the work of uh, independent counsel yet to be appointed, uh, it was the judgment of the chair that it is more useful to wait until the appointment of the independent counsel and have discussion with him before calling Mr. Demery before the subcommittee. The witnesses at today's hearing will be Ms. Carol Crawford, former OMB Associate Director for Economics and Government, and Mr. James Hammernick, former Director of the HUD Office of Insured Multifamily Housing Development. Mr. Hammernick is appearing today under subpoena. We have called Mr. Hammernick to testify about the HUD-related activities of Mr. Lance Wilson, the former executive assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce, after Mr. Pilson, uh, after Mr. Wilson left HUD. When Mr. Wilson was called to appear before this subcommittee, he exercised his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. In reviewing Mr. Wilson's expense accounts at Payne Weber, we found that Wilson had lavishly entertained Hammernick and during a single week in February 1987, spent more than $1,000 on him for meals and limousine services. As the recipient of such largesse from Payne Weber, Mr. Hammernick can aptly say, thank you, Payne Weber. Our next HUD hearing will take place tomorrow morning when we will examine the Passaic puzzle. Abuses and financial irregularities in the administration of public housing authorities with a specific focus on recent revelations of wrongdoing at the Passaic, New Jersey Public Housing Authority. Before calling our witness, I'd like to call on my colleague and friend, Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say that I spent a good part of the weekend with Secretary Kemp, and on more than one occasion he complimented this subcommittee, and specifically you by name, for its work in uh, leading to some of the reforms of which you spoke. And I can assure you from the several presentations that he made this weekend uh, of his continuing commitment to uh, not only clean up HUD, but also to provide as many of the appropriate services uh, for the people of this country through his agency as possible. 
uh, and I compliment you again for continuing these hearings. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comment, co comments of Secretary Kemp. Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have a couple of comments. First of all, I want to express my admiration for your uh, leaning over backwards in the matter of the Independent Council. It's indicative of the fact that under your chairmanship, every potential conflict between this subcommittee and anybody else's jurisdiction has been scrupulously avoided, and I think you have shown that it's possible to do that without in any way diminishing the vigor of the subcommittee. My own view uh, as the chair of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over the Independent Council statute is that there is no conflict ultimately in our going ahead with hearings. Uh, we should also be clear that one of the topics we may get into uh, with Mr. Demery is one of the topics that Attorney General Thornburg specifically excluded from the Independent Council, namely the question of perjury. And that, people should understand, uh, has been specifically excluded and we might get into it. So I believe that we will be able to question Mr. Demery. I think uh, we have seen in previous trials, whether you go back to Watergate or the Iran-Contra situation, that when people do their jobs well, congressional investigations and sensible prosecutions are not mutually exclusive. I want to comment on one other aspect of that, and I'm really borrowing the subcommittee's time, and I'll be brief, uh, to talk about the Independent Council statute in general. When that statute was vindicated by an 8 to 1 vote, which constitutionally had been challenged, and in an opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist it was upheld, a uh, very intemperate and inaccurate dissent was written by Justice Scalia. I say inaccurate because it wasn't simply a matter of constitutional interpretation. It was a matter of uh, a prediction he made. What he said was that we had uh, gravely jeopardized the independence of the executive branch because he said the independent counsel statute being found constitutional, it would be an invitation to Congress any time there was a dispute with the executive branch or frequently when there were disputes with the executive branch to insist on an independent counsel being appointed. And he said it wouldn't be hard to get a majority of members of a committee to do that and the result will be a proliferation of independent counsels to the harassment of the administration. One of the things that we don't do enough of in this society is holding people accountable as to their predictions. Justice Scalia's prediction was absolutely inaccurate, and I think this is a good in time to mention that because, yes, we've just had an example of members of Congress voting to ask an independent counsel be appointed. And I want people to understand, when the Judiciary Committee did this, at the initiative of two of our colleagues, Mr. Morrison and Mr. Schumer, it seems to me that uh, their judgment's been vindicated. And the notion that Congress will be abusing the independent counsel statute in the manner that Justice Scalia predicted is simply wrong. And I think it is important to note this perfectly legitimate use of it. And your own care in, uh, in, in approaching this is, uh, is relevant to that. So uh, the last point I would make is this. People should understand, and we deliberately wrote the independent counsel statute this way. The appointment of an independent counsel means only that a question exists. It does not mean that anyone is guilty. It doesn't mean that anyone is going to be indicted. As a matter of fact, under that statute, if after an investigation a subject is not indicted, the federal government will pay his or her legal fees. Independent counsel statute recognizes that it could be difficult for people in one administration to investigate a colleague in a criminal matter. And we provide a neutral way to do that no inferences ought to be drawn or ought to be drawn the way that statute was written. No one based on the appointment of an independent counsel has any basis for concluding that Secretary Pierce did anything wrong. What we have is an investigation. And let me close by saying, I think we can all be proud of the fact, if you look at the independent counsel statute, in most cases, an independent counsel's existence has served to vindicate an accused individual rather than to prosecute. There have been some prosecutions. There was a prosecution of Mr. Deaver, there were prosecutions in the Iran-Contra case, the prosecution of Mr. Nofziger, uh, later overturned on, on uh, other grounds. But most of the independent counsel who have been appointed have come back and said there is no basis for prosecution. And I think we want to be very clear. No one ought to lose sight of that fact. The appointment of an independent counsel simply recognizes that there are questions raised that it would be difficult for the Attorney General himself to deal with, and that's all. And the majority of independent counsel have come back and said, no, there's nothing wrong. And I think it is also clear, this is the first time, and I raise this, this is the first time since the statute was vindicated in my memory that Congress has acted. 
And I think the fact that Congress acted for the first time in this case clearly helps repudiate Justice Scalia's uh, wholly inaccurate, uh, mildly hysterical predictions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts for most authoritative and insightful analysis. Uh, our first witness is Ms. Carol Crawford. If I might ask you to come up to the witness table, Ms. Crawford. If you'll raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Yes, I do. Please be seated. We appreciate uh, your uh, appearing before the subcommittee uh, on a voluntary basis, Ms. Crawford. And uh, I would like, for the record, to establish first uh, the relevance of uh, your being here. You served as Associate Director for Economics and Government at the Office of Management and Budget from October 1985 through January 1989. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, you were responsible for the HUD budget during this period. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Is there any opening statement you would like to make? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a brief opening statement that simply identifies uh, me and, and um, my position at OMB, Please if I may. All the time you need. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kyle, Mr. Frank. My name is Carol Crawford, and I'm happy to be here today to address your questions regarding the relationship between an OMB budget side associate director and the agencies in his or her area of responsibility. I served as associate director for economics and government at the Office of Management and Budget from October 1985 to January 1989, as you indicated. In that position, I was responsible for the budget of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and also for four other cabinet-level departments, the Department of Justice, Department of the Treasury, Department of Transportation, and the Department of Commerce. In addition, my portfolio included the Small Business Administration, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the National Credit Union Administration, the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Federal Maritime Commission, the State and Justice Institute, the Marine Mammal Commission, the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Corporation for <coughs> Public Broadcasting, the District of Columbia, the Administrative Conference of the United States, the National Institute of Building Sciences, the Neighborhood Reinvestment Corporation, and the Christopher Columbus Quincentenary Jubilee Commission, and my apologies to any agencies I may have left out. The response you had a big job. <laughs> yes. That, that really, with my apologies for going through all of them, that really is, is part of my point to explain the breadth of, um, uh, of an associate director's uh, responsibilities in, in handling these issues. The responsibilities of an OMB associate director include reviewing agency budget submissions and making recommendations on appropriate budget allocations and policy initiatives. Subsequent to submission of the President's budget, my staff and I were responsible for tracking the President's requests in the appropriations process and for what we called budget execution, that is to say working with the agencies to ensure that the appropriations and budget requirements are met within the agencies. My staff and I also assisted in the development of administration policy in substantive areas from development of legislative initiatives through enactment of the President's proposals. My deputies and all other staff were career federal employees, highly professional, dedicated, and hardworking individuals. OMB staff were organized by branch and division. The housing branch was a part of the Housing, Treasury, and Postal Division, and it consisted of a branch chief and five examiners. On occasion, as I recall, during my tenure, that may have gone to six, possibly seven, although I, I don't believe we ever went to seven examiners, but that's the order of magnitude of the staff. The housing branch was responsible for all 
HUD and FEMA and related agency budget analysis and development, budget implementation and appropriations tracking. The housing branch also provided policy analysis and research on housing issues and generally served as a resource in the development of housing policy and the pursuit of the President's initiatives in the Congress. Thank you for the opportunity to appear and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Crawford. Mm -hmm. uh, you certainly had an impressive uh, portfolio of responsibilities, but I suspect you would agree with me that while each of the budget responsibilities you had is significant and important, most of those were dramatically less controversial and fraught with uh, problems of abuse and mismanagement than the HUD responsibility. Would you agree with that? Not less controversial, no. There were well, why would you think that uh, the responsibility you had for developing the budget or approving the budget of the commission that deals with the 500th anniversary of Columbus's <laughs> arrival on these shores is as fraught with the controversy as, as the HUD scandal. Uh, it was not. The okay. controversy was not in the smaller agencies, although on occasion there were very controversial issues that arose in the, in the, uh, in the smaller agencies. But there were controversies, I think, um, and difficulties that occurred in the other, I had five cabinet level departments. And there were other, other controversies. I think there were always, um, uh, OMB is always the, the, uh, involved in the various controversies in, in all the agencies. All right. Uh, who were budget directors while you served as associate director? Uh, Jim Miller and Joe Wright. How frequently did you deal with them? Um, the associate directors are, uh, carry a fair amount of independent responsibilities and I should, should indicate that OMB is an unusual organ, maybe not unusual, uh, in the respect I'm about to Could describe. Could you pull the mic closer to you? Yeah. Uh, OMB, from the examiners, through the branch chiefs, through the authority is perhaps not the appropriate word, but independent activity on the part of each of the examiners uh, in a pyramid structure uh, so that, that the, uh, the boss, in effect, the, the examiner's boss is the branch chief, exercise a supervisory responsibility with respect to the examiners, but the examiners are doing a variety of independent research and evaluation at all times, um, independent of the immediate supervision of the branch chief. My point of, of raising the branch chief and the examiners is that that is true throughout the organization because there is such a heavy load of work uh, on OMB. It's such a small organization with such vast responsibilities. Um, the amount of time I spent with the director varied by need. Uh, if there were issues involved um, where the director wanted to be involved or where I felt the director needed to be involved, then there would be continuous uh, involvement. Well, on the average, uh, how often did you see the director per week? Per week, uh, on average, three hours perhaps. Three hours perhaps. But it varies a great deal. I understand. I understand. You know, now, so we get a, a, a feel for your job because um, one of the puzzlements I have is that the Office of Management and Budget as uh, Mr. Darman's almost non-stop appearance on national television seems to indicate, is a very pivotal agency. As a matter of fact, you probably have heard from many, many agencies that they feel that the shots are really called by the Office of Management and Budget. Many agency heads, many agency top officials often say, well, we would like to do this, we would like to do this differently, but OMB doesn't sign off on it or doesn't approve it. So OMB is viewed in this town, and in my judgment, very accurately, as an enormously powerful agency. Isn't it true that departmental budgets go to OMB? 
OMB is the president's budget staff, yes. Is the president's budget and administrative staff. Not management staff. Uh, to the extent that. But it's called OMB. OMB, Office and of that's management correct. Management and budget. But it's very important to understand that I was on the budget side. Uh, we understand and, that. And it's, I, I simply cannot answer with any specificity um, or certainty questions about OMB's functions on what we call the management side. There's another associate director who handled the man management side. OMB today, as I understand it, Mr. Darman and Mr. Diefenderfer are seeking to more nearly integrate the management functions with the budget side functions, and I think there are certainly some benefits that would accrue from well, that would, kind of integration. There would seem to be a lot of benefits because if the management is as appalling mm -hmm. as it was at HUD for eight years, then the budget side should know about this in detail and not approve the budget submitted by an appallingly mismanaged agency. Would you agree with that? Well, I think, I think you need to distinguish. In understanding OMB's role, OMB is, as the President's policy and budget staff, OMB does in fact play a pivotal role, did during my tenure and, and does today, and I think has historically, that's the purpose of the, the agency, it's the purpose of the staff, if you think of it as the president's staff. What is important to distinguish throughout this conversation is that, that OMB's function is to review uh, budget submissions and policy initiatives to ensure that the policy development and the budgetary priorities are consistent with the President's, that they reflect the priorities that the President has established and they are consistent with his objectives. What you cannot ascribe to OMB is an ability to, to micromanage any of the agencies, even the smaller agencies, with the, the size of the staff that OMB has. It is not an intended function of OMB, um, and I think it is not with the agencies in creating the various, uh, the Congress in creating the various agencies, uh, from departments to the small agencies, set up organizational structures that were designed to, um, to provide supervision, oversight, administration, management within the agencies. For example, uh, HUD had a staff of several hundred um, uh, in, the, in the IG office, several hundred um, uh, examiners or investigators in the, in the IG office. The, the role of the IG office, the, the identification of problems within the management of the agency, HUD or any other agency, is the function and the responsibility of the IG's office, not the, re the responsibility of OMB. We, it's simply, among other things, we don't, there is not staff, I had staff. Of course. First, five, uh, six examiners. Ms. Crawford, you, mm -hmm. you use the term micromanagement. Mm -hmm. I fully agree with you that OMB should not mm -hmm. micromanage giant agencies because clearly it has not the capability or the staff to do so. Do you distinguish between micromanaging and recognizing gross mismanagement? And that's the distinction we tried to make. We tried to Identify. Was it your impression during your tenure that HUD was grossly mismanaged? Or did that all come to you as a surprise as a result of the revelations of the work of this subcommittee? Uh, I think you can look at the organization chart of the Department of Housing and Development. I don't want to look at the organization chart. <laughs> I, I, I asked you a direct question and I'd like you to answer it directly. The question, let me repeat the question. For four years, you served in a very high position in the Office of Management and Budget. You had responsibility for approving the budgets of all these agencies that you cited, including HUD. During this period, as is now clear, there was gross mismanagement at HUD. Secretary Kemp has just discontinued a variety of programs. My question is, as you approved the budget submissions of Secretary Pierce, were you aware that there was gross mismanagement of many of these programs, which now 
we understand, cost the American people billions, billions of dollars with a B. You either were aware of these and approved the budgets, or you were not aware of these and the revelations of this subcommittee made you aware of these. I'm asking which of these is the case. I started with the organization chart for HUD because it is, was literally one of the first things I asked to see when I went to OMB uh, for each of my, the, the, uh, the agencies. And looking just at HUD's organization chart, as I'm sure you've done, you can see that it is tailor-made for problems um, uh, in terms of lack of accountability, for example. Um, the, the lines of responsibility are, are not clear at all. Uh, where one would expect that there would be lines of responsibility, there are not. Uh, it's a very diffused organizational structure uh, that, as I indicated, suggests that um, difficulties, managerial difficulties, will be inevitable. Uh, I started. Did OMB I, recommend significant changes in the organization? Not during story? my tenure. My, my recollection was that it had just been reorganized into that pattern, that there, some changes had been made. Uh, and now going when you to, went there or now? now? When I went there, my recollection is that there had been a recent reorganization. But that your was testimony my recollection. is that after that recent reorganization, the organizational structure was still very bad. Well, it struck me It struck me as being one that would be difficult to, to Did manage. Did you discuss That's it with the two directors you served under, that you thought that the organizational no. structure no, 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 was no. very bad? No. Why did you keep that information to yourself? Because this is not, the role of OMB is not, as I indicated, not micromanagement. The Secretary of Housing and Urban Development is responsible for organizing. You insist on using the term micromanagement. I am talking about gross mismanagement. Now, we now have established that there was gross mismanagement. Do you agree with that? From what I've read in the papers, you have, have, uh, your hearings have suggested that there are distinctly problems, have been problems. That's correct. I mean, that's my understanding just from the, pa from the reading of the paper. Let me back up again. Well, no. well uh, uh, before you no. back up, before <laughs> okay. you back up, and I know I don't need to remind you that you are under oath, our hearings haven't just suggested that there might have been some problems. Our hearings paralleled the statements of Secretary Kemp, and they have paralleled the statements, which I quoted in my opening remarks, of the President. We now have legislation that attempted to, that attempts to clean up the hot scandal, the hot mess, the hot swamp. Now this hot swamp occurred on your watch as Associate Director of OMB. And what I'm trying to establish in the first instance... If I could interrupt this... Well, no, you none may of this, not. None of this was initiated or began on my watch. It didn't begin on your, it didn't began begin on your many watch, many years before but 1981. It went, on. it went on during those four years. I'm not holding you responsible, Ms. Crawford, at all. Thank you. For think... Let me finish. <laughs> I'm not holding you responsible at all for things that occurred prior to your going to OMB and after you left OMB. I think it is not unreasonable for the subcommittee to probe your knowledge or lack of knowledge of what went on at one of the agencies where you were responsible for the budget during the period you had that position. You opened your testimony with a very impressive recitation of the range of responsibilities you, you had, and I'm very much impressed by it. My question at this stage is, and I will rephrase it in as many ways as necessary until you answer me, whether during the period you were associate director at OMB, October 85, January 89, about half of Mr. Pierce's tenure, during which most of the abuses occurred, the bulk of the abuses occurred in this period, were you aware of this avalanche of fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement? Robin Hood just pleaded guilty, the lady who, who took five and a half or six million dollars. Um, we're talking about billions, billions of dollars lost. 
Secretary Kemp just killed the coinsurance program. Were you aware of any of this happening during this period, or did our subcommittee's investigations make you aware of this? I was not aware of any of the problems that, that this subcommittee, to the extent that I'm aware of the, what the subcommittee has reviewed, I was not aware of those problems. What I'm trying to distinguish that is, I think, important for the subcommittee's understanding is that, that OMB is a policy organization. OMB reviews the development of policy and allocation of budget resources. It reviews, for example, in the budget context, whether it is more cost effective to put money into mod rehab or rental rehabilitation programs or the 312 rehabilitation program. There were three. HUD has, HUD has layer upon layer of housing programs. As new programs since the 30s, as new housing programs have been added, the old programs have not been eliminated. They have been layered. So there is a, a very complex uh, and difficult and huge array of programs. My staff was constantly in the process of working with with um, PDNR, Policy Development and Research, at Housing and Urban Development. That is the evaluation and policy review arm, the analysis and evaluation arm of the Housing and Urban Development Department. My staff worked with that staff and did their own analysis, reviewed the literature, worked with private groups, obtained information, did their research wherever they could find it, looking, working with them. Um, uh, home builders, working with census tract data, whatever, to analyze and try to make a, a determination from a policy perspective whether the rental rehabilitation program was more cost effective than 312, was more cost effective than uh, mod rehab. That is the level of analysis and evaluation that OMB would become involved in. Alternatively, uh, are vouchers more cost effective than public housing? Which is more effective than the Section 8? How do the Section 8s and the certificates, how do those, how do those um, various programs compare in terms of their cost effectiveness, in Ms. terms Ms. Crawford, of their... Let, let me help you a little bit. Yes. Because I'm very anxious that you don't contradict your earlier testimony to the Senate committee that deals with broadly the same subject. Allow me to read to you from your testimony before the Senate, I believe on October 31, mm -hmm. 1989. Senator Graham asks you the following question. This is on page 84 and 85 of the record. Senator Graham, in your area of responsibility, that means your area mm -hmm. of responsibility, reviewing the budget, going back into the early 80s, and persisting up until the current time, there were reports of very substantial losses in various housing finance programs, in FHA and in coinsurance for two. That information was not known to your side of the house, question mark, Ms. Crawford. Yes, in fact, it was. My staff focused on it several years ago. As I recall, we tried to get HUD to focus on it. As I recall, we raised it with several members of the congressional staff. I'd have to go back and ask staff whom they checked with, not checked with, who they raised this with. Mm -hmm. It became a very serious concern. I'd have to go back and check with my staff to refresh myself who specifically we raised it with. We did raise it in-house. We raised it with HUD. There were very serious concerns growing. It was viewed to be a very sensitive issue. These are your words. The feedback we always got when we spoke on the Hill was that it was very sensitive. And we shouldn't really, we shouldn't talk about it very much. Senator Graham, who were some of these people? Ms. Crawford, that's what I'm saying I don't remember. Now, uh, may, may I when, respond to that? Well, in just Mr. one Chairman. second. Mm -hmm. When we met with you a uh, week or so mm -hmm. ago, uh, I asked you at that time 
to specifically review um, your testimony before the Senate committee uh, because understandably uh, you couldn't remember everything when you mm -hmm. appeared before them. And on January 31, um, I sent you a letter which I would like to read in part. Dear Ms. Crawford, thank you again for agreeing to appear before the Employment and Housing Subcommittee on Monday, February 5. As I mentioned at our meeting on January 24 mm -hmm. and in my letter to you of the same date, the hearing will concern your role with respect to HUD while you were at OMB. As we discussed at our meeting, I expect that you will have reviewed your records and consulted with your former staff in preparation for the hearing. Um, the hearing will concern, among other things, several of the subject matters discussed in your testimony before the Senate Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs on October 31, 1989. As you no doubt recall, at that hearing, you were unable to provide some answers without checking with your staff and reviewing your records. Though you certainly shouldn't limit your preparation to these subjects, it would be most helpful if you would review the transcript of your Senate testimony and be prepared to provide answers to all the questions asked of you at the Senate hearing. Thank you. I have done all of that. Good. Uh, I've spent time with my staff, but they, of course, had to pull files that they thought were relevant, right. and they have done that. I've reviewed those materials, and I reviewed my Senate testimony. The question that Senator Graham was addressing and my response are consistent with the distinction that I am trying to draw about the, the OMB staff function in, in analyzing uh, from a policy perspective and from a macro data uh, perspective where programs might be having difficulties and where programs need to be revised, where, where something isn't working right, where it's not cost effective. My understanding, and again, it, it may be that I haven't followed your hearings um, as closely as I should have, uh, and you may have gotten into some of these areas, but my understanding, as you're describing um, the kinds of problems that have been identified, the Robin Hood sort of difficulty, they are, they are cases where an individual uh, PHA or an individual person, uh, a lender or a, an individual has, uh, through fraud or mismanagement or, management or, or some kind of abuse, uh, has defrauded HUD in one way or another. Um, on an individual level, the, the OMB staff would not focus on individual I, I fully understand that. of, of um, you know, Senator Graham criteria asked you about coinsurance. With respect to, to uh, his question and my answer, as I reviewed my testimony, I was responding on the FHA portion of it, not on coinsurance. My, the, the coinsurance policy and the regulations and I have, have uh, confirmed this with my staff, predated me, and I, I had, I mean, I have virtually no knowledge even of the coinsurance issues. There were no issues that arose, no coinsurance issues that arose um, that I recall uh, well, during were you tenure. aware during your tenure mm -hmm. as associate director of OMB of the scandal with respect to the moderate rehabilitation program? Yes, but let me, let me respond on the FHA issue because I do think that's an important one and Senator Graham right. raised it also and, and, and it is the issue that, that you read from in the transcript. Um, when you suggested that there may be an inconsistency, I'm anxious to clarify that there's no inconsistency. Um, my statement and my well, if you are saying that there is no inconsistency, then let me clarify the matter in my own mind. Okay. Were you aware of all of these gross mismanagement problems? Were you aware of all of these <clears throat> huge potential loss issues while you were associate director of OMB, or did our hearings made you aware of this for the first time? I was not aware of the... The, gr what you characterize as gross mismanagement. You would what not we, characterize it as such? I don't know. I don't have access to the same information you have. I've not sat through the hearings, and I, I have not done the investigations. Um, it, it, I'm not a competent witness on that question. Distinguish, distinguish please, gross mismanagement or other problems. The data 
and the evaluations and analyses that the OMB staff would perform would result in a gross analysis, as I recall in FHA, my staff, and that is the, the issue that I raised that we had serious concerns about FHA losses. The numbers that my staff collected profiled the increase in defaults out of the FHA fund, very substantial increase in default levels. Now, my staff reviewed that and analyzed that from a programmatic perspective. Okay? There were other ways that the IG would be investigating with respect to managerial problems. Were, for example, the, um, were the local FHA offices not applying um, the criteria? In other words, the criteria would be established, the lending criteria would be established by policy. But it is an entirely separate issue and one for the IG's office and for the, the managers in, in the department to determine whether the problem resulted from the local FHA offices not applying those policy criteria, those guidelines, whether they were in fact violating the guidelines. If you review the IG reports as they're published and sent, they are sent to Congress, they're not sent to OMB, I might point out. The IG reports, we have summaries that, that we received every six months. But if you review the IG reports, you will see that, that probably a majority of those reports um, involve uh, investigations as to particular, as to allegations or investigations of particular mismanagement, particular abuse, particular violations of established procedures or simply um, uh, illegal activity. Well, let, um, me, let me ask you a specific question about, I, let, me, I, let me ask you a specific question about your budget responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, may I, may I complete my response on uh, the FHA issue because it is an important one. Go ahead. And you raised it in the context of my Senate testimony. Um, the OMB staff would review the overall, the macro data on FHA and would analyze a trend in defaults, a trend in income, a trend of, of uh, profiles of the, um, uh, the income levels of people who are receiving FHA loans, etc. Macro data to determine whether there might be problems. Early on, and I think probably before I went to OMB, the staff, because again, examiners are conducting research on a continuing basis. Associate directors come and go. They continue their research and analysis in an effort to try to, to identify policy problems. With respect to FHA, it became clear to my examiner staff, my analysts, that there were uh, rising default levels. Uh, I can't tell you whether it was as a result of our analysis and a request to HUD that, they un that, that um, the department undertake a study of, uh, of FHA defaults. It may have been a sui sponte uh, undertaking on the part of the secretary, but uh, the secretary did undertake an analysis of FHA defaults. The report was issued in the course of, of my tenure at OMB. And in following out the findings, in, in following through with, with the findings, identifying where the default levels were, we were able to track what seemed to be the greatest variables that were causing the high defaults. Now, what we did with that data, I'm giving this as an example, one, because it's very important, and, and Senator Graham raised it as well as you're raising it, but it also, I think, explains how OMB functions in this kind of issue, how we try, we OMB tried to identify problems and how we treated them. Looking at the macro, in that case, we may have gone to put the uh, policy development and research PDNR at HUD to ask them to undertake a study or an evaluation where we might spot a problem. That was a macro analysis of the, of the program. It was not an ident trying to identify where there might be individual violations. As a result of the HUD study. We understand uh, this very clearly, Ms. But, Crawford. But you're really, you're really wasting tied, the committee's time I, by trying to emphasize with your that you indulgence. Did, well, let me, let me make a statement. With your indulgence, well, let me, because I will, I will, I have indulged you and I will continue <laughs> to indulge you, that, but please, please understand that the committee is fully capable of differentiating <laughs> between a specific problem in a specific community of theft, embezzlement, abuse, 
for which OMB is not equipped in any sense, in terms of staff, responsibility, jurisdiction. We understand that. The problem with HUD was that there were major programs like coinsurance, like uh, mod rehab, which were grossly mismanaged and politically administered. This was admitted by former high-ranking HUD officials. You keep referring to your responsibility at the macro level and your unwillingness to engage in micromanagement. I'm not asking about either of those. What I'm asking of you is a very simple question. I don't think you are giving me a straight answer. So let me go at it another way. Let me take it out of the HUD arena. Suppose you have responsibility for the State Department budget. And there is now a, a case of the Moscow Embassy having been built without any regard to security. And you have a white elephant sitting there costing the American taxpayer, whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, if the State Department were to come in and ask for another $200 million for that embassy, you would say, oh, that was gross mismanagement. We will have to tear it down. We are not going to give you another dime for that. Now, at HUD, there were far greater examples of gross mismanagement than that one embassy fiasco. My question is, what did you do about it as the evidence was coming in? We zeroed out mod rehab. Well, you think that's that, a... Is that a, that's the straight answer you're looking for? That's, that's a, what we Well, did. that's a direct answer. It is a singularly unsatisfactory answer. But because that's the, that is the answer, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. How about coinsurance? Did you zero out coinsurance? Coinsurance was not a budget item, I don't believe. I don't remember ever seeing it. As I say, I don't recall any coinsurance issues ever coming up, and I don't recall in a budget context that coinsurance... In other words, there is no line item for coinsurance. Coinsurance, as I understand it, and I'm not even that familiar with it, frankly, um, coinsurance was a... a, 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 a um, it was a, a means used by FHA to administer the insurance program in multifamily. I believe it was only used in multifamily, not in uh, single family. But I'm really not very familiar with it. It, it predates me. There were no issues that arose uh, during my tenure. But mod rehab, uh, there were problems. The problems we identified, however, that led to the zeroing out of mod rehab um, were not the kind of mismanagement problems, per se. They were the programmatic reasons that mod rehab was not a cost-effective program, that there were too many layers of, of uh, subsidies. Now, I, I might, y you might be able to tie in the two, and I hadn't thought of this before, but to the extent that, that mismanagement or high consultant fees or whatever contributed to a higher cost factor for mod rehab or any other program, those macro data would be analyzed by my examiners, and that would contribute to a finding that a mod rehab program would not be as cost effective as, for example, the rental rehabilitation program, which was one that, um, that was recommended as an alternative means of, of providing rehabilitation well, explain assistance. One, explain one thing to me. Mm -hmm. Were you recommending the building of uh, very large number of uh, affordable housing units low income for low income people were you recommending that we were recommending the shift away from construction assistance among other things because yeah. they were more expensive into vouchers well i understand the voucher vouchers i understand the voucher theory but vouchers up. don't create affordable housing there were two ways of providing housing for low-income people. One... More than two. Numerous. Well, I think there are two basic ways. And you tell me what other basic ways you find once I cite to you the two. One is to create new low-income housing units. Or two, 
rehabilitate existing housing units which are non-usable, the mod rehab program, and make them usable. Now, what other broad areas are there? Yeah, because broad. vouchers don't create any new housing for low-income people. You know that well, as well as I do. I don't think you intend, and, and, and I'd be happy to engage in a discussion about housing, housing theories. Um, the research that, that we depended upon and that formed the basis of President Reagan's housing policy was that vouchers are vastly more cost effective. The voucher program is vastly more cost effective than either the rehabilitation or the new construction models. That you can house an individual family for a third to a half the cost using a voucher uh, compared with, uh, with um, one of the other construction, direct construction or rehabilitation models. Well, the, the voucher program the exists year period assumes the existence of a housing stock at low rental fees. Isn't that true? It assumes, and that, that assumption has been borne out. It has been borne out. What do you mean? With, with the exception of some very tight housing markets where, in general, there are rent controls that have, have enforced a, uh, not a contract, well, perhaps a contraction, uh, of housing units. See Mr. Frank getting interested in this. Um, well, let me, let me that, be happy. Yeah, but I think we've just gotten a misstatement there, and I'd like to get the factual basis. You're saying that the tight housing markets exist only without rent controls, or mainly no, without rent controls? I said I'd like you to submit the list of the tight housing markets and which ones do and don't have rent control. How many big cities have I rent control? How many big this. cities have rent control, Ms. Coffey? Oh, numerous. How many would you guess? Numerous. Uh, I'd have to think of my list. I mean, dozens. Dozens of big cities, in your yeah. judgment, have rent control. I, I think you're grossly exaggerating. I'd like to ask you to submit your list, and uh, I think we will then. Uh, but in your view, dozens of large cities have rent control, and that's where well, the tight housing I mean, markets are. What's a large are. city? They, the last time I asked my staff for a list of, of rent control cities, it was a long list. Whether mm -hmm. it was two dozen or six dozen, I don't remember. Well, I would be talking and about cities that were in the hundred thousand or more. When I said a large, large uh, city, I would be talking about. I don't remember. I don't well, know secondly, I think you're, you're size of city. I mean, do, does mm -hmm. Detroit have rent control? Chicago, Los Angeles? Do you know? A lot of California cities. How New about York, Detroit, North. Chicago, Cleveland? I don't remember the specific okay. cities. I, I think what you're giving us is an ideologically predetermined response about rent control without the facts. And I would ask you to tell me what's the list of tight housing markets in your judgment where vouchers have had a okay. problem, and how many of them have rent control? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's that's um, OMB information, but I'd be happy to request it for you. Well, since you cited it, I thought you had access to it. I'm only asking you to back up. I'm not asking you to do any research for us. I'm simply asking you to back up what you said. If what? you tell me you can't, then fine. I don't, I don't think it, no. you can. I don't have it. The right. last I, would time. Say, I think that you've just made statements without factual basis. If you've got the factual basis, I'll be willing to see it. But I think what you've given us is an ideological reflex that blames rent control where it doesn't exist. And if you can show me that rent control exists in some of these cities, I'll be glad to look. No, I, but I don't, you don't know I whether don't it's in the, you it don't now. know if there is rent control in Detroit or Chicago. No, or, would you say that they were cities with tight housing markets? I don't remember. Okay, well, I don't remember that, specifically what right. cities had the tight markets right. and which ones. I, 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 I think you, that proves my point that your statement about rent control being the cause of a tight housing market or being strongly correlated with tight housing markets is really an ideological reflex based I'd on be, no factual information. I'd be happy to provide the, uh, the data upon which that was based. I would be great it, at it. It reflects, um, as a matter of fact, the research I think was done by an outside group. Uh, it was not done in-house at OMB. I think it was contracted research. It may have come from PDNR. I don't remember the source of it. Um, but it is a paper that seeks to identify as an analysis of how the voucher, it, 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 well, if, let me finish. If, no, I'm talking voucher, about rent control. I didn't ask you about the voucher program in general. I have different views on that. But I, I was talking about the specific assertion about rent control being generally present where we have tight housing markets, which I think is untrue. Um, I think there's a lot of tight housing markets where there is not rent control. And that's the specific point on which I would like your factual information. Oh, I think I didn't, I didn't say the converse is true. I think there may well be tight housing markets. And you I said I, most of the tight housing markets, I think, I said in were general, rent control. It seems to me. I understand that. I think that's inaccurate. That I don't know whether in general is less than most, uh, but I don't think you know what you're talking about, and I, that's why I'm asking you to, to produce the results. I'd be happy to provide the, the paper. Well, let, let me shift the inquiry into, a, into another <laughs> <Yes>. arena. <clears throat> you, 
you were responsible for the Urban Development Action Grant budget, is that correct? That's correct. Can you describe for us what Urban Development Action Grants are, commonly known as UDAGs? UDAGs. UDAGs hmm. were a form of grant program uh, administered out of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. The award was made to the city. The city, there were th these grants are, uh, there's such a multiplicity of them. I, right. I hope I'm, I'm telling this, uh, describing this accurately. I'm sure you will. I believe uh, UDAG went to the city. The city awarded the grant. Uh, the program was initially designed to uh, allow uh, redevelopment, uh, allow a city to, to fund redevelopment uh, of its uh, economy. Um, uh, focused on uh, employment, uh, increasing employment, uh, economic revitalization of the community. Mm -hmm. My understanding, my recollection is that was the original intent of Congress in setting up the program. Now these UDAG grant lists came to your office, is that correct? On occasion we would get UDAG grant lists, that's right. Well, they had to. Not probably. necessarily to me, to the examiners. Well. On occasion I would see them. Yeah. Why do you think these lists contain the names of developers and consultants rather than just the description of the project itself? I don't remember that they ever did. Well, they did. I, never, I don't remember ever seeing that information. Uh, the list is it your testimony that you never saw a proposed UDAC budget? My testimony budget? is to the best of my recollection, I never saw that information, but I'm not certain that I ever saw a list of UDAG grants other than on occasion we would request, uh, the only time I specifically remember asking for a list of UDAG grants was if we were trying to put together, uh, we were seeking to eliminate the UDAG program as you may know for many years and we would make lists of and compile lists of how many UDAG grants were going to f for hotels and the Hilton Hotel Corporation, things of that sort, to try to convince the Congress uh, that the program was not serving the originally intended purpose and that it was not the best use of, of uh, appropriated dollars. Ms. Crawford, it is my understanding that OMB would receive from HUD a list of UDAG requests in ranked order including the name of the developer or the consultant pushing the UDAG application. And OMB therefore saw and knew who the recipients and the beneficiaries of UDAG awards would be before deciding on the level of funding. Before the level of budget funding? That's correct. We zeroed the program out. You we sought to eliminate the program. Well, you approved. And we did eventually succeed. I mean, my recollection when is that I zeroed When did you succeed in eliminating the program? I think it was, it actually has not been, I mean, let me be specific. That's right. My understanding is that it has not been eliminated in the sense that the statutory authority has not been removed from the, uh, the books. We, we succeeded in FY 1990 in having Congress provide no new funds. But you were there in 86, 87, 88, and 89. Mm -hmm. During those period, UDAG grants. We sought, we sought, no, I think in every year I was there, I don't remember ever providing any money for UDAG in the budget. We sought no funds for UDAG because it's not a cost effective program. You and your testimony is that you never saw lists indicating names of consultants and developers. I don't ever remember seeing such a list. Did you ever consult with Secretary Pierce about HUD? On occasion. How many times would you say during your tenure? Not more than half a dozen. Did and I speak with him who personally? Did you seek to meet with him or did he seek to meet with you? I probably sought to meet with him. I can't remember, I don't remember a time when he asked to meet with me. All right, why would you seek to meet with him? Tell me, tell us to the best of your ability those half a dozen occasions when you found mm. it necessary to uh, No, ask not for meetings. It, in a couple of cases it was phone calls. 
All right. Oh, how gosh. many meetings and how many phone calls would you say you may have had with Mr. Peters? A total, Peters? as I'm saying, a total of probably half a dozen. Half a dozen. Oh, Primarily which made phone calls. A couple of phone one calls. One was just a courtesy call when I first went to OMB. Yes. Um, Let's ignore that. One, I remember another meeting was to discuss vouchers and the rental rehab program. That was a meeting. The MOD rehab program? No, rental rehabilitation. Which rental rehabilitation. Rental rehabilitation program. is a different rehabilitation program that we supported. And why, did you, why did you seek to see him on that issue? I say he was there. I believe, I'm trying to picture who was at the table. It was in his office. I believe he was there. Um, do you recall any instance when you specifically wanted to see him with respect to a problem at HUD? No. I, um, I probably spoke with him on the phone about some concerns we had about the Russian activity. I know we had we had. Will you describe that the, Russian activity? This committee, as you know, had a, had several hearings on it and the report. Can you tell us your concern? Yes, the the head of PDNR. Uh, What's at a that PDNR? Time, uh, Policy Development and Research. Um, was um, a woman who. In the the uh, judgment of the examiners. Would you identify the person you're talking June about? June Cook. Ms. June Cook, mm -hmm. who had testified before this subcommittee. Yes. Yeah, I, I, yes. I don't know that she has. Um, what was your concern was, about that program? Uh, policy development and research is a, is a critical office in the Department of Housing and Urban Development for the reasons, I think, precisely that your committee is focusing on. Um, its function is to do, and oftentimes at the request of OMB, uh, to undertake research and analysis and evaluation of programs, various programs that were underway in the department in order to help the department uh, and with, with an evaluation of what programs were working, which programs weren't working, um, where criteria need to be tightened up, um, just to, to assist in the development of policy. And those results, those reports, uh, and those studies were, I will say, often generally perhaps always shared with OMB I don't know but OMB work the staff the OMB staff works very closely with the policy development arm um, uh, it was the sense of of um, the housing staff and again this predates me this was as I recall um, underway when I arrived at OMB uh, policy to the head of policy development and research had become involved in an, an effort with, I believe, the private housing groups, uh, several private housing groups, to, to um, she had some kind of a project going in Russia. I don't even know what the, the details of the problem were. But it would seem to be consuming a great deal mm -hmm. of, uh, of PDNR's resources. We had concerns because, again, PDNR is a critical program in the department Congress always reduced our requested budget for PDNR, which meant that there was not enough of the kind of analysis and evaluation that I think you have focused on as an important part of the uh, of the department's activity. Uh, so their budget was always reduced. We were concerned that budgetary resources were being drained off into this Russia project, which then would not be available. And you uh, were sufficiently concerned about this to call the secretary. Uh, Yes, I was, um, I was. What did you tell him? I told him we had concerns um, about what June Cook was doing and, and how much time she was spending in Russia, uh, the amount of Mr. resources Pierce's, that were being. What was Mr. Pierce's response? He said that he'd look at it, that he'd investigate it. He was very supportive of this project, however. He was. Do you know that he spent more time in the Soviet Union than the Secretary of State? Did you know that at I the time? I didn't know that. I knew we had concerns from the PDNR perspective that, that their resources seemed to be the head of, the, uh, of that unit, which is a very important unit. 
in terms of, as, I mean, it ties in so importantly and with the And their limited resources work. were used we're for... being diverted. Yes. Be glad to you. His absence made much less difference to the department to the absence of almost anybody else. That's why they probably weren't worried about it. So one of your telephone calls related to uh, the Soviet project. I, c I, I would not be willing to swear to any of this. It's my best recollection. We understand that. I mean, my recollection is that you said, did I ever phone him about a problem? My recollection was that I, that I think I phoned him at one point okay. to express concern about PDNR. Well, I want to commend you for activity. that because the subcommittee had concerns. We held hearings. We issued a report on that subject. And, uh, and I certainly personally fully share your concerns about misuse of resources. Now, let me try to refresh your memory. Do you recall any other meeting with the secretary or telephone call with the secretary which was prompted by your having found the problem at heart? Not that I remember. Another time I remember meeting with him as I had had, had him for lunch at OMB or at uh, the White House. But there was not, that was again a courtesy lunch. That was a My final no question on, on this round relates to your role mm -hmm. in screening potential candidates for assistant secretary at HUD. Mm -hmm. Did you participate in um, interviewing potential assistant secretaries? Yes. Not consistently. I did on occasion. Mm -hmm. whom some did I you, and some whom I did you interview who subsequently became an assistant secretary? Uh, Tom Demery. Um, I remember that because he was to be a witness. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have to see a list of of uh, assistant secretaries while I was there to remember if I had interviewed any others. There were many I interviewed that I sent a recommendation back on that I felt would not be appropriate, did not have the proper background or credentials or whatever. So I mean, so I inter interviewed many more than, than uh, who eventually got sure. the job. Sure, sure. What, uh, what did you look for apart from the obvious qualifications in these candidates? Did you look for a response uh, basically advocating the cutting back on housing programs? Was that a litmus test issue with you? No, because we didn't cut back on housing programs as it's commonly described. Uh, outlays more than doubled uh, during the Reagan administration. I think there's a tendency for the press to focus on, on uh, BA, budget authority, which is new money into the pipeline. I think when I left OMB, uh, there was something like, uh, on the order of magnitude of $200 billion of, of uh, housing money in the pipeline that we'll still p spend out over the next 15 to 20 years. Um, so the pipeline was simply overloaded. Um, outlays, again, outlays the actual checks that are written uh, more than double during the Reagan administration. and. Um, there is some irony, I think, in, in, um, in the, the reasons for the reduction in BA, in our requested BA out of the, the uh, HUD budgets. Uh, the B primary BA, BA. B budget authority, uh, the primary, the driving force in the housing programs, and again, I didn't initiate this, but I was fully supportive of it in the Reagan administration, was to find more cost-effective ways of addressing the nation's housing needs. The fact that vouchers uh, cost a half to a third of what a new construction um, model would cost um, was always missed, it seems to me, in the press and in the Congress, and that you could, you could house two or three times as many families over the same 15-year period uh, using a voucher as you could uh, using a, through construction of a well, new unit. Without Restarting well, uh, the voucher dialogue. Let me ask no. you my let me ask you my final question. The current director of OMB, Mr. Darman, mm -hmm. as you know, sent a letter to all departments cautioning departments to be certain to read IG reports so another hot scandal won't develop in their agency. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of this letter? No, I'm not, but it's a good idea. <clears throat> I say it's a good idea. It's obviously a good idea. I think from the OMB perspective, I think it's important for Congress to, to review those IG That's reports. Correct. Um, 
The IG reports, as I understand it, go to the Secretary and to the Congress. Um, my staff, as I understand it, and, and this is upon consulting with my staff pursuant to your request, um, my staff received six-month summaries of IG reports, a document that looks like this. Uh, six-month summaries of IG reports, and if you, you have these reports, I'm sure, and you have access to them, um, the I vast majority, them. <laughs> sir, I'm sure, them. the vast majority of these um, go to individual problems that they have identified. Wound Socket mm -hmm. Housing Authority um, Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program in Wound Socket, Rhode Island, a particular problem that the IG identified. Um, Upon but that problem reviewing, may be a generic problem, may it not? I mean, it could oh, give you correct. a clue. That's correct. For but instance, again, tomorrow we are going to be dealing with the Passaic Housing Authority, where, that's according right. to the IG report, that's an right. individual had four jobs, mm -hmm. all paid for by HUD, and the individual making more money than the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, even it, though a problem may be a specific problem, it may mm -hmm. open up a whole avenue of investigation I think which may have great relevance for what you like to call a macro issue. I think that's absolutely correct and you have put your finger precisely on the problem that you're looking at. Uh, to wit, looking at the summary of the IG reports and identifying where a particular problem exists. In other words, the wound socket, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. it may have been that they weren't following the guidelines. Right. It's an isolated problem. My staff, when I reviewed with them what they did with the IG reports, they indicated that they would get these six-month reports, they'd look through them, they would try to identify where, um, where a study might suggest a bigger problem than just the individual problem. They did that at various, and then they would, they would request copies of any IG reports that they felt might have some broader application than just an individual mismanagement, abuse, fraud, or whatever. Um, but by going through the summaries, you, you can't always tell that, of course. And so you had access to the full reports, the didn't you? The full report, but again, with five or six examiners, it is not physically possible unless okay. Congress chooses to, to double or triple the size of OMB staff. Well, I think Mr. Darwin is asking It's not for realistic that, yeah. to see. Well, that's okay. Yeah. It's not realistic to Are you suggesting suggest that they that, would have the ability to, well, let to me, review let me the reports. Put it this way. <laughs> Did OMB have any responsibility for the hot scandal during the four years that you were there as associate director? I feel more comfortable answering that question if you'd be more precise instead of a, a generic, did we have responsibility? I think everyone has responsibility. Well, uh, not everybody. I well, think lots I think of people everyone, had no responsibility for that. Everyone in the administration and everyone in Congress, I think. No, um, I don't think so. I don't think everybody in the administration. I don't think that, I don't think that the Secretary of Agriculture oh, had no, much no, to by do that with that. But I, by that I mean the department, the secretary on down, any, any agency official who was well, in a position we to, clearly established the fact to be aware of that the HUD under Mr. Pierce was mismanaged. That's Secretary Kemp's judgment that is, seems to be no longer in, in dispute. The question I'm asking you, since you were one of the top officials of the Office of Management and Budget, which had the responsibility to oversee HUD, among other agencies. Is it your testimony that your agency bears no responsibility for the HUD scandal during this period? I would say we have to accept a certain amount of responsibility. Um, I will also say in the same sentence that uh, 2020 hindsight is wonderful. Um, I, I think the distinction I'm drawing is that OMB, and I will, will limit this to my housing staff, my former housing staff, is a very small staff that works 14 hours a day, eight days a week, just carrying out the responsibilities it has. Um, and that is one of the problems at Passaic, where the individual who presumably had four jobs needed eight <laughs> days and 14 hours. No, he needed 19 hours we a needed, day to We needed many hour. more. They're very hardworking people. They are very dedicated career individuals. Okay. And um, 
in going through, the IG is first and foremost responsible for identifying problems of mismanagement, fraud, and abuse. That is the responsibility of the IG, not the responsibility of OMB. Now, to the extent that OMB's staff, through any means, through research papers, through, through um, PD&R, through newspaper reports, through working with private sector groups, to the extent that they are able to identify a, a specific mismanagement problem, mismanagement, fraud, abuse, lack of cost effectiveness, any kind of problem, clearly the OMB staff will seek directly on a staff level or it would bubble up to the associate director, the branch chief, the deputies, or the associate directors. And there are various ways in which OMB then communicates with an agency seeking to get the agency to investigate the problem. Again, from a programmatic perspective, um, we would, would um, generally go to PD&R. We would sense that something is not right programmatically. Uh, we may see an IG report that suggests that there are some problems. We would go and ask for an evaluation. And these, these discussions are going on all the time at the staff level. I didn't even, wasn't even aware of many of them. So your testimony is that OMB bears part of the oh, responsibility. I think, I think they must. And they I think, I think I um, if you review Bill Diefendorfer's, and, um, uh, Bill Diefendorfer's testimony uh, as to ways in which OMB is, is seeking to, <coughs> to uh, reconfigure and establish new lines of reporting, I think that is an effective way of using OMB's resources, very limited resources, to try to prevent this from happening again. Congressman Kyle. Chairman, uh, just to conclude on this last point, we all learn how to do things better from experience. And uh, I guess my first question to you is whether or not you think the experience that um, we have uh, gained as a result of these hearings and other uh, revelations concerning the, the way that HUD was managed under Secretary Pierce uh, suggests uh, an enhanced role not only for the Congress but also for OMB in its management function of agencies such as HUD. I think definitely, uh, definitely I think you have identified problems that OMB in the past because of resource problems has not been able to, to uh, pursue as aggressively as it might have, as, as it might have wished to. But I think you also raised the good point about, about Congress. I think, um, I think it was Bill Diefendorfer's testimony who pointed out that, that Congress has, oh, I don't remember how many, forgive me, I, I don't remember how many, but dozens of oversight committees uh, that have oversight over HUD. And the committees, previous to this investigation, the committees had not uh, apparently been able to identify or, or um, or remedy the kinds of problems that this subcommittee has now identified. I think uh, it's fair to say that we've all learned from this experience, and we've acknowledged that Congress has a certain amount of responsibility with respect to the problems at HUD as well. The point, I think, for all of us is to learn from, from, the, from the past, to learn from what um, has occurred, and uh, I think, I, I gather then that to the chairman and you and I are all in accord in uh, suggesting that in the future not only, uh, and we've already concluded this with respect to Congress, uh, but also specifically OMB um, should pay more attention uh, than it's done in the past or had the ability to do in the past uh, to IG reports as a valuable document that uh, might not only suggest policy problems with an agency under its jurisdiction, but also administrative problems that go directly to the heart of management, which after all is part of the responsibility of the Office of Management and Budget. Yes, I would, would mention um, in the context of, of answering that question, uh, that there was, as I recall, a, uh, there was a statute in 1982 or 1983, financial, financial integrity and managers, something or other, a, a statute that was designed to enhance uh, the ability of financial managers in various agencies uh, to carry out their functions. OMB's role in, in helping to implement that statute uh, was to promulgate uh, two or three circulars, which, which uh, this OMB circulars um, function as guidelines for the agencies in carrying out either executive uh, policy or in this case a statutory policy. 
And my, uh, my recollection, and this is from my staff actually, I can't claim credit for it, my recollection uh, uh, from my staff uh, was that OMB promulgated the guidelines, um, but that HUD did not follow the guidelines. And again, that is an area that I think the IG, uh, an agency IG is responsible for making sure that once the guidelines are promulgated, that the agency officials subject to those guidelines, who are carrying out those guidelines, uh, that they in fact follow the guidelines, criteria that are established, that the criteria are in fact followed. Um, my only, my only ca caveat, I think, in in concurring that, that OMB ought to take a greater responsibility is the same caveat I would, would, um, would establish in responding to the Chairman's question about accepting responsibility. And I would underline this, uh, that OMB is a very, very small organization. And its ability to monitor um, problems in HUD or any other department are by definition limited by the number of staff, by its budgetary and staff resources. Um, so I think if, if, if it is the intent of this subcommittee uh, that OMB should have, have uh, exercised greater responsibility and track in monitoring for this kind of problem, I would urge that the subcommittee uh, go to the Appropriations Committee and urge that the budget be increased, the OMB budget be, because speaking again just for my staff, the HUD staff and my other uh, examiner staff, they simply physically cannot do uh, all the work that is that is expected of them. Well, I think this raises uh, also a very uh, difficult uh, question that I'm sure uh, causes all of us on the committee some concern. If we are to set up the office of OMB as the grand nanny of the U.S. government, I suspect that some of us would have some problems with that on occasion as we uh, work programs through various departments of the government thinking that they have the most knowledge and background and uh, understanding of the legislative history and what Congress is really trying to achieve. And I know from my own experience, for example, having worked hard to get a bill all the way through the process and then find somebody at OMB uh, uh, expressing concerns at the last moment before the President's to sign it because of the monetary or fiscal implications, rather, um, uh, caused me to wonder just how detailed we want OMB to be and, and how much of an overseer we want it to be. So on the one hand, I think maybe it's fair to say that like everyone else, like all of those concerned, OMB might have had some responsibility for the Scud HUD uh, scandal that by the same token, there's a question about just exactly how much power we do want it to have. That's more of a comment than a question. I've got two other, uh, two other quick C things. Could I follow up on that comment, sure. Mr. Kyle, if I may? I think that raises another good point that I did not touch upon, and that is to the extent that, that OMB has micromanaged uh, an agency by trying to enforce stricter guidelines or tighten criteria or whatever, and going back to FHA, we did it in many cases. Um, uh, informally, we tried to get HUD to, uh, to tighten up on their guidelines. Uh, we, when, we, when we identified the, the, um, uh, what we saw to be um, a, a problem that could well develop into a serious, very serious problem with HUD and the defaults, we sought um, uh, legislative proposals in Congress that, I mean, we had a range of proposals that we tried year after year that would, um, uh, that would increase the, uh, the premium, uh, that would tie premiums to income levels, that would, this is a very important one that was identified in one of the IG reports, we found that uh, the highest default levels in, FH, in the FHA program, the s substantially higher default levels were experienced by investors not first home purchases that you read about as the, uh, the basis for the FHA program, but by investors, by speculators, by builders who you've, uh, use FHA as a bridge mechanism. Uh, we sought to, to uh, uh, in our budget proposals, to eliminate the eligibility of investors uh, or, or uh, second homeowners, vacation homeowners from the FHA program. And again, with an eye towards those high default levels in those categories. Um, and we frankly got the back of the hand from the Congress. Uh, the, the banking committees and the appropriations committees uh, really rejected the, the efforts that we made in trying to bring that kind of problem to the, the, uh, the attention for statutory remedy. Uh, so 
that's my well, excuse I, mean, me I for wasn't going to get into this, digressing. but just, just to uh, state the case for vouchers, uh, Mr. Chairman, this being a good example of a case where there's a difference of opinion. Uh, OMB can determine that in its judgment uh, or in the judgment of the administration, a particular concept for managing or budgeting would, would produce savings or a better result. Uh, Congress uh, may or may not agree with that. In the mm -hmm. case of vouchers, I happen to agree with you, and I just wanted to, uh, to state, uh, Mr. Chairman, while there may be room for debate on the subject, uh, in, in my understanding of the concept of vouchers, you actually uh, empower people through a, a voucher where there is a demand and thereby create the supply so that, in a sense, the private sector can respond where there are vouchers and create the housing. And uh, as the witnesses testified, in concept at least, that can be done more cheaply. But uh, I, I won't get into that. I just want to close with, sure. with uh, to be sure that I'm clear on something. There is one area that I don't think we can implicate OMB, at least from what I understand, and that is of showing any favoritism in either the, the MOD Rehab Program or the UDAG Grant Program, That's because right. in both cases OMB was not recommending projects for specific consultants or developers, but in fact was recommending no funding for them. That's is correct. that correct? That's correct. Thank you. I want to thank my colleague. I merely want to uh, repeat an observation that I made to Secretary Pierce last spring when he did in fact appear and testify before us, which as I recall indicated that uh, if you couldn't kill it, you chose to milk it. So the fact that uh, you wanted to kill a program and then you failed to kill the program does not mean that uh, people in the program did not then milk the program, which is precisely what uh, high-ranking officials did uh, by favoring uh, people who were connected to them politically or otherwise. So the fact that the first preference of, uh, of Mr. Pierce and others was to kill the program, which is not a very intelligent solution when millions of people are desperate for affordable housing, having failed in killing it, they chose to milk it. And that is in fact the the sorry history of mud rehab uh, during the Pierce years. Congressman Frank. Thank you. Uh, but, but let, if, if I may, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if there's an implication that, that that milking went on through OMB, I think it's important to understand that milking did not go on through OMB. OMB well, played no part in that. Well, OMB that, that's itself did not milk it. If, in fact, uh, I am correct, that in the UDAG grant list, the names of consultants and developers appeared next to programs, it is not unreasonable to ask why OMB did not object to having those names appear so that it could make an objective judgment without knowing that James Watt or some other highly placed individual was interested in program a, B, or C. We had nothing to do. My examiners clear up the line to myself, or the director had nothing to do with the decision making as to who gets what grants. Matter okay. of fact, OMB, and this is a this is across the board at OMB. It's not just in my staff. It is it is it is a a work ethic, if you will, at OMB that they do not get involved in any individual grant. That they simply do not get involved in individual pro project. Or Ms. Grants. Ms. Crawford, I understand that. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. UDAG grants were presented to OMB, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't, no, they weren't. Well, allow me Those to finish. Those decisions were not made. We allow had nothing to do with the decision making process. Allow me to finish. UDAG grants were part of the budget you approved. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, we never saw any individual grant applications. No. When you say... I am not saying you did. Please, please listen to me carefully. Were UDAG grants part of the OMB-approved HUD budget? No. Well, who, we who approved not those? Fund. We did not fund UDAG. We rejected funding for UDAG. Every I year, don't remember... Year, year. My, my recollection is that the administration at one point was going to zero it and was persuaded to change that and then later did. But I, 
I will tell you that at some point during the Reagan years, the decision to zero UDAG was reversed. It was one of the programs that Secretary Pierce, in fact, fought to retain. The and Secretary it was not every year zero, so it's simply not true. Now, I, and I don't believe it was every year of those four. It was ultimately knocked out, but it was not zeroed every year in the, in the OMB, in, in the President's budget. I'm reasonably certain, I'm reasonably certain that I never approved in my markup of the HUD budget that I, I, I always zeroed it out. That is my best recollection. I don't remember ever. You may be thinking of uh, CDBG. No, I assure you, when I think of UDAG, I don't think of CDBG. CDBG I do not confuse UDAG and CDBG. And I will tell you that at some point, I don't remember when, I remember Pierce got it reversed and some of the, some of the beneficiaries the got it reversed. The secretary um, requested money, as I recall, in UDAG. The secretary did like UDAG. And we zeroed it out. Well, let every me, year, I did four budgets. Every year, to the best of my recollection. Well, let me tell we you, we zeroed out UDAG, right. but we never, as a part of that decision-making process, we never saw the grant applications. That's very important to understand. Well, I fully understand that, but I don't think you understand what I'm talking about. So let me clarify it and then yes. turn it over to my colleague. We are talking about an eight-year Pierce administration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. During that eight-year Pierce administration, for a number of years, Mr. Pierce submitted a budget request for urban development action grants. Mm -hmm. It was a lump sum item, mm -hmm. whatever That's it right. was. That's right. Two hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay? <clears throat> you agree with that? I don't remember the numbers, but it was a lump sum. It was a lump It was a large lump sum. Yes, yes. Okay. As backup for that large lump sum, there was a list. You may never have seen that I, list. I, I never saw it, and I'd be surprised if it even came to OMB. Well, I would be surprised if it didn't come to OMB, because I don't think OMB got materials with no backup. My understanding is... That's, this, this can be very easily resolved, it seems to me, by well, asking... but before we resolve it, let's Asking OMB whether, in fact, as part of the budget submission for a particular year, they received that kind of information. Because I never saw it if we receded, and I'd be surprised right. if, if they sent that over. All right. Let me tell you what I think. The, the, the budget cycles are not, the budget cycles don't match. The budget for 1991. Forget about 1991. I'm not talking about. Went to OMB in August of 1989. I understand it. So it, there's a but mismatch. That's not relevant. And they wouldn't have the application. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that that would, that information would come over. Well, the initial submission may not have the list, but a subsequent submission of materials might contain a list. Allow me to explain to you how I believe OMB may have known who was involved. If OMB at any time obtained a backup sheet for the lump sum request, which listed projects, mm -hmm and listed with the projects the names of consultants and developers. If that occurred, would OMB be in a position to know who benefited from these UDAC grants? No, but again, it, it's, there's a mismatch. The, the budget request that comes in and is decided during the fall of, for example, 1989, that is marking up a budget for 1991. So there is no way that those applications can be, are connected in any way with the 1991. Well, of course there is, of course there is no, a way, I because think, the decision no, on, on the extent, well, let me tell you how it is possible. And it's just, there, there are funding rounds no, I think what you might have, if you have a list that has that information, again, I've never seen All right. a list with that information. My, my best estimate would be, my speculation would be, that it is not a list of, of uh, uh, pending grant applications. It may be a list of grants that were awarded in a particular grant cycle. The only list that I ever remember seeing is when we would <coughs> compile for use in Congress, how many hotels, you know, how many Hilton hotels, and how many uh, pizza parlors, and how many this and that, that sort of thing. But they, it never had any information, and it had the, uh, whether it was a Hilton hotel in uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, 
um, and the amount. But it didn't have any other information about about who consultants were. I mean, I'd be very surprised. Do you have such a piece of paper? Well, we will. That I could we see will, we the only thing that, 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 meet that with would make any sense. OMB and review ask this eight-year period. Kind of information. Because if there was ever that information sent, the only way I could imagine it would have been sent would be after a funding round. There were I, three or four funding rounds, as I recall, in a year. Is it reasonable to assume that people who may not have made it in one uh, cycle were, were then high up in the next cycle? I, I don't know. My, my, my understanding is that they recompete. Mm -hmm. Congressman I, Frank. I don't know the details. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, from Knowledge of Unite Program, your last question is absolutely in point that people who did very well but just missed the cutoff in one round would very often mm. be told, in effect, that they would be in good shape uh, and, and could almost count up for the next round. Ms. Crawford, I just you, you referred, you said Mr. Diefenderfer referred to dozens of subcommittees that have jurisdiction over HUD. Yes, if you refer, Would you he had tell me dozens? I get three I in each know. house. I don't know what they well, are. Well, I either. think that's what your rent control list. Uh, there are not dozens <laughs> of subcommittees that have. There is in the Government Operations Subcommittee 1, the Appropriations uh, Committee 1, uh, the uh, Banking Committee 1. Now, maybe there are some others, uh, uh, but I would tell you, having been on two of the three and having worked on housing for nine years, I don't know of another subcommittee this of the House. This is someone else's number. I can't claim credit okay, for it. Okay, be careful. No, no, don't only not claim credit for it. Don't rely too heavily okay. on numbers which you can't substantiate. I will tell you that this notion that dozens of subcommittees have jurisdiction over HUD is fanciful. Now, maybe in some remote possibility, the Armed several? Services Subcommittee. Will you three. Several? Three. No. No, the, the Appropriations the, Committees, the, the uh, no, Government the appropriate, Three in each House. The Banking Committee. Which, wait a minute, stop. Let's go one at a time. Small you want to do this? Let's go one at a time. Which ones did you say have it? Appropri the appropriations. One subcommittee. Right? One, one subcommittee. Two, two. One on each side. One on each side. They said in each house, mm -hmm. yeah. The banking committee, one in each house. Mm -hmm. Government operations or government affairs. affairs, one in each house. That's the only ones Small that really work. Budget? The budget? No, the budget doesn't have, the budget committee does not have they subcommittees. Have a, they have a housing staff. No. The budget committee, Ms. Corbett, you don't know what you're talking about, but that doesn't but they do. stop we you. Work with them, the it? fact is that the budget committee does not do any oversight. It lists housing numbers in the grossest mm -hmm. source. It is not an oversight subcommittee of the, uh, in, in any real way. They don't have hearings. And as a matter of fact, the Budget Committee doesn't have subcommittees. The Budget Committee in the House, I don't think in the Senate, doesn't even have subcommittees. It has one committee, and it looks at these things. In the way in which you suggested it, subcommittees with oversight responsibility, uh, there are basically three in, in each uh, House. The three include the Government Operations Subcommittee here, which has not just HUD, I'll ask, I'll ask Mr. Defender for to I, phone you or to provide I wish you would. But I, again, I, the, the, the suggestion that there were dozens is just outlandish and, I, I and a caricature. To, I have to say that, that I concur in the surprise because when I saw the number, whatever it was, I don't remember. But you didn't think that you would a, find out what it meant or just would use it. Well, uh, your surprise is one the, of the, the best founded. The point that I'm making is that there are several over several subcommittees in the Congress with over. No, Ms. Crawford, that was not the point you were making. All. I take it, Ms. Crawford, please. Yes, there were several. There was a difference between dozens and several. I didn't deny that there were several. I denied that there were dozens. Dozens gives a false impression. I and I, No, Ms. Crawford, I will finish my sentence. Dozens is what you talked about. If you want to withdraw dozens, fine. But dozens gives a very different impression. And as a matter of fact, it is not simply that there were basically three here, but the staffs are rather small. And in the case of the Government Operations Subcommittee, a primary oversight subcommittee, it has jurisdiction as well, not only over HUD, but over the Department of Labor, the National Labor Relations Board, the Department of Labor, of course, includes OSHA, the uh, EEOC. EEOC, the uh, Office of Personnel Management. So I think talking about dozens of subcommittees gives a very inaccurate impression. I think if you go back to the transcript, you will see that I was citing I was citing to another source. I did not say that as my own. And you don't stand by the source my own. Okay. No, Fine, I, if you have no particular simply, reason to, uh, usually when people cite a source in that context, it suggests that they are in substantial agreement with the source. But if you were simply citing it in a I sort of a random Mr. sense. I will ask to okay. give you a list of no, the I, committees that he included in that list. As, as long as you say this is his number and you have no particular relevance to it, okay. Let me ask you, given what you said, am I correct in inferring that there wouldn't be any reason for anyone to share with OMB the list of specific grantees? Your view generally is that, that, that there would no. be no legitimate governmental function that would be served in that submission. Um, my assumption would be that, that my examiners, 
the, the examiner who would handle UDAG would, as I indicated, would request a list of the, the grantees after the fact. After grantees, the fact, but not a pending grant. You would, no. There would be no reason why anyone would want to tell no. OMB, anybody from HUD, about pending grants. I, I, not that I was ever As you've described it, there'd be no legitimate reason. Okay, I, I that's, think so. that's, that's, yeah. uh, Because again, OMB is not involved and specifically stays away from a Specific voice. grants. So there would be no, any, any no legitimate reason, as you understand it, for anybody at Harder Elsewhere to approach OMB about a specific pending grant or a grant that had not yet been Not that I'm provided. aware of. Okay. Um, with regard to Mr. Kyle's point, and I appreciate his making it, I think he's right, and Congress sometimes can be inconsistent, and there are complaints if OMB gets too far into things. One distinction I think I would make would be that where we were talking about efficiency, uh, which is what much of us would have thought of as management, we would be more willing to see OMB get in than into policy areas. And uh, I guess the way you were deciding, describing management, it seemed like efficiency was not the basic issue, but that uh, policy seemed to be more of the concern. Um, and I guess that would be what I would say. I would, I, I, you said that you were not primarily on the management side, am I correct? That's right. OMB, th there are four. I understand. No, please, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't ask you to everything. I just, you, well, you're not in the management but side. It, but I Who would have responsibility? for efficiency. Would, w where in OMB would complaints about the efficiency of an agency or the honesty with which it was spending funds, to what part of OMB would those complaints go if people had them? There are two kinds of efficiencies. One is cost effectiveness from a policy perspective. Right, I'm that's, talking about the other kind. That's the budget side. Efficiency in terms of, of I think what you're asking for, whether, um, whether an agency has, um, has financial controls in effect that are protecting right. the agency. That would be the management side of OMB. And there are a series of, um, uh, of OMB circulars that set out procedures that should be used. Yeah, are there to, personnel to in OMB to which complaints would go about that or, or if people heard things that weren't working well? Um, I can't answer that. But you're saying that as an associate director, the, the, As a, please, me, please let me answer well, that. No, answer. no, no, no. I will ask you a different question. If you didn't answer that one, okay, we'll try another uh, we'll one. No, Ms. Crawford, answer, you will please let me ask the question. The I question is, do I understand you correctly that in your view as a role as associate director, you were not primarily concerned with what we have, you have just described as a second type of management question, that your concerns were the dollar budget figures and the policy-oriented cost-effectiveness kinds, but the other kinds of, of, of efficiency were not primarily your, or, or were not your responsibility as, a, as an associate director? What I think you're asking about was the managerial issues were primarily the responsibility of OMB's management side. Right. Now, I was going to say, uh, as a second part of that answer, trying to be responsive, that the deputy director during my tenure, Joe Wright, um, headed the PCIE President's Commission on Integrity and Efficiency, I think it was, um, which, which involved working with the, the various agencies, and I believe that organization w consisted of the IGs of the various but agencies. But it wasn't part of OMB? Yes. Joe, well, Wright, the IG? Joe Wright headed up that, that organization. And the IGs then were part of OMB in, in, no, in no, that no, sense? No, 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 no. Well, you said that As before, to Mr. Lantos, you suggested that looking at the IG report wasn't OMB's basic responsibility that that was Congress's, and I understand it was Congress's, but now you're saying that when I ask you who was doing management, you say well, it was Mr. Wright working with the IGs. No. He had, he had, and I can't give you many, much in the way of detail on this. Again, at OMB, there is such a large amount I said, Ms. Crawford, that's repetitive. That's I'm just asking you for what you, you do know. know I if can't, you, but, okay. All right, if you can't tell me, then tell me you can't tell me. I, we don't have to keep going back into Deputy, what OMB is like. My the question deputy was director chaired a group of um, a group that consisted of all the IGs, okay. And in the context of that org, that group, it doesn't make them employees of OMB. It doesn't make them part of OMB. So within OMB, the group, there was the organization of IGs. They worked together. They coordinated. They shared information. Mm -hmm. They shared procedures. That was chaired by Joe Wright. But within, was deputy director of OMB. Yes, you've said that. And within they OMB, right. the kinds of management within OMB that, that you're interested in. Was Mr. Wright 
did Mr. Wright's staff from OMB work on implementation of that, or was it just the IG staffs? I don't know. Okay, because what it sounds like you're saying is that it was really considered to be almost adventitious to OMB, that Mr. Wright, as an individual who was deputy director, chaired this committee, mm -hmm. but there doesn't seem to be much OMB function on the, uh, on the management and, uh, you're and, saying, and efficiency you know, you're side. You're assuming an answer. I'm saying I don't know. Well, I'm I telling you what you tell me. Was there anywhere else? You were an associate director of OMB. Was there anywhere else in OMB that you knew? The management that staff could have been staffing it for him. I just don't know. You don't know whether they I would have know. been concerned with uh, efficiency or other kinds of management issues. Management like staff, Let me ask yes, you about the, is concerned with efficiency. Did you, they staff this PCIE group? I do not know. Did they also deal with HUD at all, do you know, with these kind of yes. issues that we've heard about? Management staff dealt with management issues on all the agencies. Yeah. You're uh, on the Russia situation. You mm -hmm. said you were disturbed that the June Cook staff was spending so much of their time on Russia. June Cook. I don't know about her staff. Yes, you said her staff. I said June Cook. I don't know about her staff. You said the PD and our staff, I thought that, I mean, Ms. Corbin, this is surprising to me. I guess we'll have to get the transcript and have it read back. My strong recollection is that you said that you were concerned not just about June Cook's time, but that the resources of PD and R which had been cut. Now, did you not refer to Congress having cut the resources? Please I'm, answer my I'm, question. Did you not refer I'm to Congress? trying please, to be specific. Please answer my question. Did you not refer to Congress having cut the resources of PD and RSF? Now, did we cut June Cook's budget? Person, I mean, did we cut her salary? No, PD and R okay. resources. So therefore, when you talked about the resources having been cut, we weren't mm -hmm. talking about June Cook only. We were talking about the staff. Okay, and I my clear to, recollection, try please, to answer. no, not until I've answered the question, because you gave a misleading answer. And I don't want that to happen again. I want to be clear on the question. You said that you were concerned, I am sure I recollect this, that the PDNR staff was spending more time than it should on the Russia project to the detriment of some of its other issues. Now, that is then you correct. Just, my, oh, that my is correct. My concern, well, please let me explain. My concern was that June Cook was spending a great deal of time in Russia, okay? That was the concern I raised with the secretary. Not the staff? Let me finish, please. My concern in terms of draining PDNR resources is that by implication, I was assuming that my immediate concern was June Cook spending a great deal of time on the Russia project. By implication, she was not there to supervise the staff, number one, which was important. N the staff needs to have the full-time direction of the Assistant Secretary for PDNR. And secondly, there would be an implication that some of her staff resources would be used to staff her activities in Russia. Now, I think you're splitting hairs, and I no, appreciate hairs. the it's opportunity to clarify. I am not that, splitting hairs. No, that I am, I, was my concern. I'm not splitting hairs. You just took, you, you, you changed what you say, and I, I found well, you, frankly, to be very unresponsive. I was not I will show you the transcript when we get it. Specific. You said before that you were afraid that the PDNR staff, which had been cut by Congress, was spending too much time on the Russia project. Now you're saying, no, that was just by implication. Um, it would seem to be first place it should have been more than by implication. You looked into this. Did you have any sense of where they were spending? Do you now know where they were spending all the time? Because I think you're right. I think it was a disgrace that they got spent all this time in the Russia project. Not just Secretary Pierce, but Assistant Secretary Demery went to Russia twice within a, a three-month period. Some of us complained about it and insisted that they stop it. Did they stop it? Did you get them to reorient their activities? We referred it to the IG, as I recall. And you don't know what the outcome was? I do not. Were you not empowered to... Uh, insist or could the director of office of management budget you bring a problem and this i'm, I'm just concerned about because the ig has no uh, might not have enforcement after a capabilities. point where where we had expressed concern and i had it's my recollection that i talked to the secretary about this i'm not certain of right that. i understand I that I i'm not talking about whether or not you talked to the secretary um, you said that the the trips continued the secretary was very supportive of the trips um at one point my staff raised some specific problems i don't remember what they were that we felt it would be appropriate to refer to the IG. Um, and we did that. It's the function of the IG to investigate and if in fact there were problems. That's true in, in one level, uh, but from the cost effectiveness on. thing, that's also yours. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I'm actually kind of disappointed mm -hmm. going that you would not have had more power to enforce what seemed to have been a perfectly reasonable judgment. Well, OMB they is not as um, omnipotent as, as many seem to think it is. Right, and I don't think it's omnipotent. We're talking to the secretary I'm about a concern we have as a fairly yeah. high-level response. And if he ignores that, then and there's not much you can do about it. if the secretary chooses not to change anything, I mean, 
mean, is the president going to call the secretary in and complain about this? I mean, that doesn't well, happen. Well, not, not if he doesn't. Not, realistic. not if he doesn't recognize him. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Frank. Is there any additional observation you would like to make, Ms. Crawford? No, I'd be happy to. On behalf of the subcommittee, questions. I want to thank you very much for your thank testimony. You. Thank you. Uh, the next witness uh, is uh, Mr. James Hamannick. And before we call the second witness, the uh, chair would like to make an announcement. chair received a request from Mr. Hamannick through his attorney invoking his right under House Rule 11.3.F.2 as a subpoenaed witness not to be photographed at today's hearing and also invoking his right not to present testimony during television and or radio broadcasting of this hearing. The subcommittee will of course observe this House Rule but of course this hearing remains an open hearing and all members of the media are free to take notes and to remain here during the Hamannick testimony. So I would like to ask that uh, television and radio coverage now cease and uh, we'll call Mr. Hamannick to the witness table. C-SPAN is a non-profit cooperative of the cable television industry. Since 1979, C-SPAN has given its nationwide audience